Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to our breakout session on uh, protocols and smart contracts. Um, this is the scalability session. Uh, my name is Tyler Evans. I'm the CTO and co-founder of BTC Inc. Um, and I want to uh, turn it over to our panelists to introduce themselves. Good morning, everyone. Chris McCoy here, part of the StoreCoin team. Uh, we are working on a zero-fee, programmable, high-throughput, decentralized payments infrastructure. So to simplify it, if Ripple is going after Swift, we're going after ACH, debit, and credit card networks with payments. Um, my name is Zaki. I work on Cosmos and Tendermint. Uh, Cosmos is a connected network of sort of scalable side chains. So like dApp chains is what you should think of. Um, we are... Uh, we, that's, that's what we do. Hello, I'm Jordan Earls. I'm the co-founder and lead developer of Quantum. And uh, Quantum is basically a smart contract platform on a like Bitcoin-like blockchain and that uses proof of stake consensus today. Like it's been launched in September and already working and have like over 6,000 nodes. Um, and in quantum, you can basically write like Solidity smart contracts like with Ethereum and uh, yeah. Great, well, uh, <clears throat> you know, this morning we're talking about scalability, which has become quite the buzzword in the blockchain community with every new project promising gazillions of transactions per second while maintaining complete decentralization. Uh, so to dive into this, I wanna take a step back though and, and talk about a little bit about why, why is scalability important and what are the scalability challenges that projects today are, are starting to run into? And I'll, I'll open this up to our entire panel. Um, I could start. So clearly the, the scalability challenge is that we are, we're, we've seen signs that there's a demand for uh, sort of Byzantine fault tolerant applications um, like dApps. Um, uh, Augur launched and you're seeing, but you also see the, the flip side of that, which is um, very high gas prices. It you know, every question that you ask on Augur uh, costs $50 in transaction fees to create. Um, and no, there's no distributed application today that has more than a couple of thousand daily active users. Um, and for the space to succeed, we need to see million daily active user dApps. And so that's why scalability is hard. Scalability is hard because it's computationally expensive at the smart contract layer. Jordan and I were discussing that with Quantum. Yes. <laughs> Our vision for it is you, you can't have scalability without decentralization, and it's really challenging. And so we're getting sacrifices there across all types of projects. But for us, it looks like you know thousands of transactions per second with thousands of computers and consensus processing those transactions so that you have truly censorship resistant uh, transactions and and uh, you know with networks like Ripple you have 1500 transactions per second with 75 you know validator nodes with EOS you have 50,000 plus transactions per second with 21 nodes so you get throughput but you don't get decentralization then you go to you know uh, Ethereum and you're looking at you know 5 to 17 transactions per second with about 21,000 computers in Bitcoin, and three to seven transactions per second with around uh, 12,000 computers. So you get decentralization and censorship resistance. You don't necessarily get through, or you don't get throughput. So the trade-off is, is, is massive. And then, so then we get delegated proof of stake uh, inventions, which trade off and you end up with some form of uh, censorship, non-censorship resistant environment. I think, uh, <clears throat> you know, finding those, those trade-offs is something that a lot of projects are experimenting with and that we're seeing this whole range of, of um, people trying to attack this triangle. So uh, maybe if each of you could uh, talk a little bit about the particular project that you guys are working on and the approach you're taking to scalability and maybe where you're making some of those trade-offs. Um, so at Quantum, we're basically uh, looking at you know, existing technology built by other projects like uh, Plasma from uh, Ethereum and the whole uh, Lightning Network concept from Bitcoin because we're kind of compatible with both those ecosystems. Um, but ultimately, like, we, we feel that the uh, next level of scaling is going to be from the uh, 
like level two scaling, not on the core blockchain layer, but rather a layer like a protocol on top of that, that is, um, you know, built to be trusted and potentially with some centralization. I, I, I think Chris is right in that, you know, scaling is for most cases going to have some kind of compromise as far as decentral decentralization and how much throughput you can actually get through it. Um, uh, I'd, and um, the, uh, the thing that we're really looking at is basically building, like researching how to kind of combine the different technologies that these other people are working on into something that works best um, on our unique blockchain that uses like a different underlying model than most, than most projects. Um, yeah. So I think the, the sort of continuum, so like having a single, you know, a set of servers on AWS is a very scalable solution, but you have absolutely no fault tolerance slash fault resistance. Uh, there's an admin and the admin can change anything. Um, and then there's the question of how much overhead over, over that is censorship resistance. Um, you know, Bitcoin and Ethereum are, are sort of well doc, sort of demonstrated censorship resistance results, but like, and systems, but they're, um, they are, that censorship resistance has a price, um, $50 to create an auger market. Um, so the question that Cosmos is trying to answer is one is we, we focused on A, trying to max, to build the most sort of fault tolerant, fault resistant scalable system that we've, that, that, that we've built. That's sort of work that has been going on um, since 2014. The question of whether or not Cosmos and Tendermint will be censorship resistant is sort of TBD. Um, it's a very difficult thing to reason about. It's a completely different security model than what uh, uh, proof of work offers. So we won't know really until we have a live network. Um, and so we'll find out later this year. That's awesome. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that's a very honest answer. Uh, our take on it, we're, so we're building a payments network and we look at, you know, Visa does upper end 24,000 transactions per second, Tencent, Alibaba about 225,000 transactions per second. So we're not bound by some of the challenges of smart contracting systems with many extra signatures and compute cycles to process. We're just a payment system, similar to Bitcoin or Dash or Bitcoin Cash. So. Our approach is we need that censorship resistance and we need that throughput. And, and able to do that, it's not a, you know, we're not introducing sharding or other forms of uh, you know, off-chain scaling or even layer two. We're focused on taking the new approach to consensus altogether where we call it parallel and pipeline uh, block production. So instead of one block at a time, with our consensus engine, we call it block fin, we're processing multiple blocks in parallel. And it's, it looks a little like as, as the current block is being finalized, the next set of transactions are coming in to start building the next block. And how they're doing that is taking the orphan blocks and the chain forks of the previous block and using that just as actually a gas, as, as almost just a, a resource to create faster natural throughput. And so for us, that's table sticks for success. And, and <coughs> with that um, block fin model, what types of scalability results are you guys seeing, Chris? Yeah, so we're testing now with 220 computers, which is nothing like Jordan's team. We have over 6,000 live computers processing transactions. But, but I imagine that you probably have more throughput still. <laughs> yeah, so, so our goal is we expect to go live next year. So we're an early project. So we have a tremendous amount of respect for Jay and, and, and the Tendermint and Cosmos team. They're really pioneering not only BFT technology, but the the, the open building of that. And so this is a project to pay a lot of attention to if you really want to understand the future of where P2P consensus is going. But for us, is, is we anticipate our ability to have uh, about 220 computers in the network, 5,000 transactions per second next, next year. And then as we make optimizations to get to about 5,000 computers with 20 plus thousand transactions per second, then hope to be able to have uh, hundreds and thousands of computers and hundreds and thousands of transactions. Um, I also uh, just sort of pair off that a little bit is so you, you run into this challenge that sort of seems inherent, which is you have this trade off between like, oh, you have 5,000 transactions per second. You want to verify them all. Um, you need a large computer in order to handle that many um, transactions per second. 
a key thing to understand is that like the tr this apparent trade-off between having like very centralized a very centralized network in order to handle the high throughput um, and verify the high throughput is probably just an artifact of current technology. Um, probably something like in the neighborhood of three to five years, we will be making we will we will we as technologists will be able to offer like very different trade-offs. Um, this is simply just the best that we can do right now. Yeah, we agree with that. So we have a we have a we tell a story internally. We look at the early days of oil, right? The early days of oil, you had just kerosene, and it was light. The most most of the the oil was actually waste. It was thrown into the lakes and the rivers, and we look at that's kind of where blockchains are right now. And, and our design is to take that waste, orphan blocks, chain forks, and actually use that to create faster throughput. And yeah, three to five years, we think we'll have empirical uh, stories that show that we could solve these as an industry, uh, but we we need that time. Zach, you mentioned the, those kind of hardware constraints. How much of uh, the um, scalability challenges that we're seeing today do you think can be solved by software optimizations and, and how much is gonna be driven by hardware and, and Moore's law? So I think we've all found that consensus is a big bottleneck. Um, on 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 the on on the um, and like sort of Cosmos was born out of a consensus project, um, Tendermint, which was a no was like the first algorithm that took about forty years of BFT research and incorporated into a blockchain setting. Um, that so like removing the cons so like first you remove the consensus bottleneck. Um, then hardware becomes a bit of a bottleneck as well. Um, you know, we we do for Cosmos need for at least our validator nodes people to be running you know server class hardware, mm -hmm. um, but w w we wouldn't necessarily see that much more throughput from like a mainframe um, or like a much larger c uh, computer. We would like w more throughput is going to be gained either from like parallelization approaches like what Chris is talking about or. Um, or other approaches like that. To that, I, I think right now we're expecting a lot of our validators, right? They host the data, they listen to transactions, they, they count, they audit. It's a lot of processes that a validator node or a miner is taking. Uh, our approach is to separate into a, uh, a two-tier architecture. And so we introduce what's called a message node, which more or less hosts the data and the validator node uh, has access to the data. So the validator node still is a full client, but it almost looks like a light client. So it requires less hardware. Our goal, and we won't get there right away, is to make it so that you could be you know, walking to the grocery store, having your node on as an app, and earning, uh, earning tokens for providing uptime compute to process consensus. Um, we look at it almost like the history of technology has showed us that any process will get to the smallest piece of hardware. And we're seeing that now with these Lime and Bird bikes. And the problem is transportation in short distances. It's now down to a GPS controlled scooter. And I think that it's likely that P2P consensus engines will get there, but it's gonna take longer than scooters. Uh, I think that, um, you know, like part of the bottleneck and the problem with like, oh, why can't you just add more computing power and make the blockchain faster? Like, it's just the way that the technology is built, um, like adding another node in some algorithms, like what you're uh, talking about and everything, like, does help, but by default, like, how blockchains have been built, like Bitcoin and everything else, um, is that another node doesn't really do anything, and mostly you're not constrained by you know network throughput or compute throughput or anything like that. You're constrained by the actual protocol has some kind of safety limit because you know you're also having to worry about these uh, tiny little IoT devices with a kilobyte of RAM having to somehow receive a uh, transaction or a payment or some kind of state from the blockchain, and um, <coughs> you know like because blockchain has to kind of cover the entire gamut of, um, of like computing devices, it's very difficult to build very high throughput without excluding some of that. Um, and so that's like kind of the whole topic of like 
full clients and light clients and everything and kind of what that means. Usually you're making some kind of compromise with light clients that, you know, have, might be severe or might be very minor, but it's definitely um, almost always like a little bit less secure than like a full node. Um, but anyway, I'd say all that to say like basically the, um, the blockchain has to like cover everything and, and that makes it very hard because, you know, the lowest common deno denominator is kind of what you have to target. And, um, you know, without, without new technology that allows you to actually like uh, have multiple levels or something like that. Yeah. So our, our next panel is uh, consensus algorithms. So we're, we're bleeding a little bit into that. But um, as, as you mentioned, Zachy, the consensus is, is the piece that adds most of the overhead to these um, protocols. Uh, could each of you talk a little bit about kind of the consensus approach you're using in your project and, and how that informs the uh, scalability properties? Yeah, so I'll start with, like, we started our testing working with uh, the Cosmos kind of underlying consensus engine, Tendermint. If anyone is doing any sort of innovation in this space, highly recommend to spin up a node and, and start to test. The, they've pushed not only the engineering around BFT, but they've opened it up in a way that creates, we, we, we all get to stand on their shoulders. Um, so very thankful for the work your group has done. And we've taken a unique approach in that it's a two-tier architecture. Signatures are expensive. For decentralization to exist, you need a lot of signatures, right, to cryptographically uh, uh, talk to each other. And, and so for us is separating the architecture so that the overhead of the signatures doesn't fully weigh down consensus, but we have a lot of signatures. So that's a trade-off we have to make in our consensus engine in order to get decentralization. Um, so uh, as he mentioned, uh, our consensus engine is Tendermint. Um, Jay, who will be on the stage, I think right after this, will uh, is the inventor of Tendermint. Uh, when, so the history, so, the best way to think about consensus is people have been thinking about consensus since the mid 80s. It's like been an interesting computer science research problem. Um, and then Satoshi sort of came from left field um, and came up with a solution that had a bunch of properties that um, consensus researchers hadn't really thought were useful and it turned out the system was then very deployable. Um, and what we've seen since then, re really starting with people like Dominic Williams and Jay working on this in 2014, was asking the question, well, okay, so we have this, this, this proof of work consensus engine um, that's, that's dem demonstrated to, be wor to work. Um, what can we learn and apply from 40 year, the preceding 40 years of, of BFT research that um, can be applied in the same setting and maybe get us around some of these performance bottlenecks? Um, and what we're in the position of right now is we're seeing over the next year or two the fruits of that work starting to be deployed in public blockchains. Um, and hope, and I suspect that will be result in a major um, decrease in the, or increase in the amount of available scalability um, without as many trade-offs in terms of security. And for quantum, it's um, like not nearly as exciting as these two, <laughs> but, uh, because we're like, you know, focused on like the layer two scaling, we're not really uh, focused on changing our uh, core consensus algorithm. But for right now, um, basically we're using uh, like proof of stake, but different from like the whole uh, DBFT, um, anyone can stake, there's no voting, there's no um, like, there's not validators and nodes, they're like one and the same. Um, so right now, like we achieve like a very modest like 70 transactions per second, but um, we're mainly focused on basically building our blockchain as like, you know, something that institutions use or something like that in the future. Like you don't go to a coffee shop and say, hey, I'm gonna wire you some money so I can buy, some, buy a cup of coffee. It's just too much overhead. And so that's why we're, kind of thinking like the blockchain is kind of going to be the same as like wiring money, like these back-end processes that people don't normally interact with. And that's, you know, their bank or their um, whoever they're using. Um, so instead, like, we're focused on basically making that like stable and everything else. 
but then um, having like the layer two for like the equivalent of like credit card transactions or um, even ACH or whatever. Um, but uh, yeah. And this layer two approach is, is something uh, a number of other projects, uh, especially Ethereum are, are pursuing um, yes. with, with Plasma. <laughs> Could you guys talk a little bit about kind of just the, the uh, families of different uh, layer two solutions and, and scaling approaches we're seeing kind of throughout the industry? Sh sharding, right? Sharding is, is uh, it works. We'll see if it works in a, a P2P consensus engine. It's very challenging to navigate a $49 billion aircraft midair. And cross shard communication gets expensive with hyperscale. So that will be another experiment that we'll learn. So, um, so you see, so what, what there is, is there's basically, there's, there's some notion of, okay, so like you have, you have blockchain, you want to make it scale. Well, what are, what are your options? Your options are one is that you can sort of achieve some sort of compression where many transactions occur off chain and then, and that converts into a relatively small number of transactions on chain. So that's the sort of lightning payments channels, plasma all sort of exist in that family where there's a requirement for some on-chain activity, um, but there's going to be a large sort of off-chain surface area that's going to give you your, uh, your usability. Sharding is, is the reverse. It's can you, wh how much throughput can you get on-chain, but you give up the idea of any one client verifying the entire chain, and you give up the idea that like a transaction is, is atomic um, within like a single block or a single execution uh, uh, sort of s sequence or epoch. Um, so those are basically the trade-offs that were that seem to be close to production in some way or another. Um, Cosmos's approach is is having separate chains that can communicate with each other. You can kind of think of it as sharding light, um, but sharding light that can be deployed in 2018 and not 2022. <laughs> I think Vucky mostly covered it all. <laughs> um, so yeah, I mean, like, just like he said, there's, you know, the level one stuff like sharding where, you know, it's the actual core blockchain protocol. And then there's level two where you're basically building something on top of it to compress transactions and everything. Yeah, I don't, I don't have anything to add. <laughs> yeah, and our general thinking is that any project can actually get improvements if they optimize for reducing data. Right. And that's where I think as an industry we can all get better at. And I think we'll have to get better at it while still enabling uh, BFT and, and security. We are uh, almost out of time here, but I, wa I want to shift the, the last couple of minutes we have to talking about kind of what's the impact of all this. Uh, Zach, you mentioned Augur, which is one of the first uh, decentralized apps where users are really feeling the burden of scalability and, and feeling that through high fees. So in a, in a world where some of these scalability challenges are solved, what does that look like and what are the new applications that are gonna be possible? Uh, so I, I, I think there, like, there are significant signs that there is like real consumer demand um, for applications where the consumer has skin in the game um, and like is making money, uh, is deriving income, is handling digital assets, um, whether it's, you know, and there, there's a whole class of applications that we can't really consider um, on current blockchain platforms, whether it's like apps that are more focused on, you know, social media applications where you have sort of real skin in the game and real stakes, um, prediction markets, et cetera, where uh, the, the limitations on throughput really constrain the user experience. And so I think the job of those of us who are building infrastructure right now is to come up with solutions that for the application designers and product designers of the world, they don't, uh, like the infrastructure layer problem can be solved and then they can focus on building sort of compelling applications that appeal to millions of users. Yeah, I mean, um, so I mean the real impact is going to basically be do, do people use it or do they not? Um, because for, un unless there's no alternative to blockchain, right now it's as a consumer that, you know, is just evaluating solutions um, blockchain isn't that appealing for like 99% use cases. Hate to like break it, but um, 
because you know you're you're having to pay high fees, you're having to wait 10 or 20 minutes before you can know that transaction is confirmed. There there's just a, a large number of problems with it. And uh, scaling actually kind of like, at least most scaling solutions, basically tackles all of those problems at once. And um, because they all go kind of hand in hand. And so like figuring out the whole scaling problem is, I, I don't think it's gonna determine if blockchain survives or not, but I think it's gonna determine, you know, if blockchain becomes mainstream, if you go, if people start going down to a coffee shop or wherever and paying for the coffee with, some kind of blockchain token. Like that's not possible right now. Like it's not practical right now. Um, but you know, with scaling and everything, it could be. So we're all building payments infrastructure on some level and the band of the existence for a developer or a merchant is that 2.5% transaction fee plus an additional 30%. So we think the killer use case for blockchains right now is zero fees and that's what we're focused on. And once that's solved, it opens up uh, a new environment for innovation, not just at the micropayment layer, but at the payments layer. So our focus is not on smart contracts. We think those are years away. We think that it's inside the application layer, giving developers the ability to do zero fee payments uh, and incentives. And that's how we get uh, sound, globally trusted money through P2P consensus algorithms. Well, unfortunately, that's all the time we have. Uh, please join me in thanking our panelists today.